We now move on to the final session and it promises to be a fascinating end to day one. We're going to hear from Jeff Eggers, who is currently a senior fellow at New America, as well as a founder of his own advisory and coaching firm specialising in strategic leadership. We haven't had many speakers with a resume quite like Jeff, so we'll draw lessons from working with two presidents in the White House, as well as his career as a US Navy SEAL, to discuss the 21st century leadership landscape and how egoless leaders and purpose-driven teams is the collective model of organisation performance. So please welcome Jeff to the stage. And good afternoon. Uh, again, my name is Jeff Eggers, and I research the intersection of organizational performance and behavioral science. And since we're now officially into summer, I want to start with a question. Um, how many of you are planning a beach vacation this summer? Show of hands, how many? I'm going to put my hand down because I'm not. This is the first summer I've won the argument with my wife, and we are not taking a beach vacation. And this is because I actually don't enjoy the beach at all. And I've learned that I'm an outlier. I read somewhere that 70% of Americans prefer their vacations on the beach. And I won this year because I don't like the beach, and I finally figured out why when my mom sent me this picture of my first trip to the beach. I was two years old, and it was my first trip to the beach. It was the Pacific Ocean, which is deceptively cold, by the way. And then she told me it was to Coronado, California. And all of a sudden, it made sense. Because my second trip to the Pacific Ocean was to the exact same beach 20 years later, and I had basically the same miserable experience. I think the only difference the second time was that I didn't cry as much, to be honest with you. Um, but now it started to make sense why I can't stand the beach. And in my first week of training, uh, I was lying doing some physical exercises, and one of the instructors pulled me out. And he took me up onto the beach and he introduced me to a journalist who was standing up there, to my relief. And it was a journalist from Fortune magazine. He was writing an article on what makes elite teams high performing. And what this journalist was doing is he was going around the world interviewing all these elite teams. He talked to the Tokyo String Quartet, Trauma Center at Boston General, offensive line of the Dallas Cowboys, and uh, racing pit crews. And it ignited in me this, this fascination with this question of where does organizational performance come from? And at the time, I didn't know anything. And I told the journalist, look, I've been here for a week. What do I know? But I've been now thinking about this for 25 years. And I start with the pit crews, because I find that this is visually impactful, right? It's a very kind of visually stimulating model of high performance. So here's a video of a, of a, a Formula One uh, team doing a near record uh, tire change. Now that's more than most people can handle, right? Most people are just like, what just happened? Um, so I slowed it down. Uh, so you can get a better uh, sense of what's going on here. And at that speed, it really is a thing of beauty, right? It really is a model of athleticism and high performance. But it's a 20th century model. Why? Because they paint lines on the ground. And they paint lines on the ground because the model of performance depends on predictability. It's repeatable, and it's efficient, and it's synchronized because they know exactly where the car is going to stop each and every time. And if the car stops at a different place, chaos ensues, right? In some ways, this is an outdated model of high performance because the 21st century is anything but predictable. And you don't need efficiency. You need adaptability. Because change is not only normal, but the pace of change today is accelerating. It's accelerating ways that are dizzying, and I'm just going to walk through a couple of them. And we're going to start with a little bit of jeopardy. What is a four-letter word for the iron fitting on the hoof of a horse or a card dealing box in a casino? Anyone? What is a shoe? Right. And with that question, IBM's Watson beat the two reigning human champions in jeopardy. So a computer now holds the title in chess, in go, and in jeopardy. First, human cognition and machine learning replaced human labor. Now it's replacing human cognition. This was the subject of the uh, World Economic Forum in Davos last year, right? the fourth industrial age. And if our kids lived through the third industrial age, characterized by automation and the rise of processing power, the fourth industrial age is really going to be about the internet, interconnectedness and speed of information. And this has now gotten to a point where Facebook has more people than China, Twitter has more people than the United States. And it's incredibly disruptive to business, right? 
52% of the Fortune 500 from the last decade are gone already. It's very difficult to keep up with this. And it's very difficult to keep up because, because not only is change accelerating, we have no idea where change is headed. I went to the Naval Academy in Annapolis, Maryland, and one of the things I had to study was every last fact and figure about the Soviet arsenal. I knew every statistic about every helicopter, every tank, you name it. And the only time in my 20 plus years in the Navy I ever saw a Soviet tank was rusting on the hills of Afghanistan when I was there fighting the Taliban. And I knew nothing about Afghanistan or fighting the Taliban because we had no idea that's where we were headed. It's very difficult. Even the, uh, the New York Times got it wrong. The New York Times editorial board on the eve of World War I, a general European war is, quote, unthinkable. But my favorite's Bob Gates. When it comes to predicting the nature and location of our next military engagements, since Vietnam, our record has been perfect. We have never once gotten it right. And it's not just the defense sector, right? Foreign policy is difficult. The commercial sector as well, Steve Ballmer, Microsoft. There's no chance that the iPhone is going to get any significant market share. Wow. World's most regrettable quote. <laughs> and it's, it's, it's not just that we don't know where change is going. Even when we do know where change is going, it's just hard to change, right? It's an incredibly difficult thing to do. This is a graph of Kodak's uh, share price. Iconic century-old brand, right? And it went bankrupt in 2012. Why did it go bankrupt? The digital camera, right? This happens to be a picture of the first digital camera ever made. Any, any guesses who made this? Kodak. 1974, they had a 24-year-old engineer who'd been at the company for two years. He figured out how to make a digital camera. He brought it to the executives, and they said, no thank you. They said no thank you because they thought it would be threatening to their business model. And boy, were they right. Right? It's not enough to see change coming. And even when you're an early adopter and you've got the right idea first, it's really difficult to follow that idea. One of the communities that understands this is the, the medical community, because behavioral health uh, really keys in on this. And this is a graph of mortality rates of various diseases over the last century, from 1900 until 2010. And I've color-coded the diseases that have undergone a radical decrease in their mortality in blue and the ones that have increased in red and orange. And what's interesting here is that all the diseases that have decreased are essentially functions of technology, right? Influenza, tuberculosis. These are diseases that have been uh, addressed through some form of technology. And the ones that have increased are ones that haven't yet been touched by technology and are essentially a function of human behavior. Right? It's not that we don't know what causes heart disease and diabetes. It's just that you can't get people to do it. And while the medical community understands this, this risk factor of human behavior, the corporate world still doesn't. This is a, a product from PricewaterCooper. They did a survey of CEOs this year asking them what they thought the top threat was. And this is just a, a list of, of their responses. And what's interesting in the list is not about the particular responses, overregulation, availability, key, key skills, government response to fiscal deficit, and so on, is they're all exogenous factors. Nowhere on their list is their leadership. Nowhere on their list is their employees' behavior, right? This goes back to NASA. But it should be. Why? Arguably, the number one corporate risk event last year was self-induced. It was a function of executive leadership and employee behavior. This is hey, a video. Say hello to Mr. Jim Balsillie. that you have the same one that I have. Shouldn't you have some fancy James Bond version? You're living the dream, man. <laughs> doesn't even have a camera. You don't have the camera one. How are things going? Things are really good, thanks. Yeah, yeah. excellent, excellent. As you imagine, um, I mean, all the things that have sort of changed in your life in the last 10 or 15 years? Uh, a lot less has changed than you would think, really. A very normal life, kind of, it, it's just a whole lot more zeros on everything. Yeah. So. Which is great if the decimal point's in the right place, you know. Uh, the, the, I mean, where, where Rim has gone uh, in the last, like, you know, did you have a moment where you thought, okay, I think we, we've reached, like, we're here? You know, not a lot, really. I don't, I don't sort of think that way. I don't, I don't sort of look up too much. I don't look down too much. Uh, you know, I just, it's the great fun is doing what you do every day. And uh, so, yeah, I'm, not, I'm sort of a poster child for not sort of doing anything but what we do, uh, you know, every day. So... Um, no, I don't really think about it a lot, no. I mean, do you get the sense that at, at this point with what the BlackBerry itself, that device has done for your company, 
that it's a matter of time before other people, like the iPhone didn't really do it. I mean, like, do you ever look at it and go, what are we gonna do if this isn't our primary business, growing rim beyond something like a Blackberry? Mm, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> Roughly die. Yeah. <laughs> so that'll just be yeah, it. Yeah. We're a very poorly diversified portfolio. <laughs> it's like, it's it's, one thing. it either goes to the moon or it crashes to earth, so. Uh, <laughs> but it's making it to the moon pretty good, so. Sure, totally. We'll stay with it. Show of devices, uh, Androids. How many of you have Androids? iPhones? Yeah. Blackberries? One? <laughs> Welcome to the 21st century. Um, I'm just joking. I carried a Blackberry for a long time. All these things make it really difficult for the corporate world to keep up, right? Um, the pace of change or inability to predict change uh, make it really difficult to keep up. And it does some awkward things to the leadership space, which is what I'm going to get into next. Um, it, it really, this gap between where things are going and our ability to adapt and keep up causes all sorts of strange distortions, and we're going through some pretty profound examples of that right now. This happens to be my son, uh, Eric. I recently asked him what he wants to be when he grows up. Uh, not surprisingly, he said, a dragon, because that's what he was for Halloween this year. Um, but it's not a typical response. Any guesses what the, the number one most popular response is when kids are asked what they want to be when they grow up these days? You, d you did not say this when you were a kid, I guarantee you. I was, I was going to be a fisherman, by the way. Um, the number one response, 37% of kids, according to one poll I looked at, said they want to be a superhero. Kids today want to be something that they actually can't do. And my kids' teachers tell me that this is uh, very prevalent in the, in the classroom, and that's very positive. They think it's a good thing because it gives the kids kind of a model of, of confidence and strength and so forth. And I have this view that it's actually an adult society. Superhero worship is anything but healthy. And I'll explain why by going back to the first comic book. It was in 1938, uh, it was Superman, by the way, and it was in the wake of the Great Depression. And then superhero worship kind of tailored off, and then it really uh, got resurrected after 9-11 and then got even further fueled by the 2008 economic meltdown. And that makes sense when you think about it, right? Superheroes were invented in the wake of the Great Depression, superheroes were reinvented in the wake of 9-11. Because superheroes are strong, they protect the innocent, they stand up against the evil, but most importantly, they do this in ways that government can't and other leaders can't. So when this gap grows between what we expect of our leaders and the challenges as we face, we turn to superheroes, right? And it's a huge problem. The the effects in the leadership space are similar. The same thing that's giving rise to this kind of uh, uh, trend of superhero worship is also doing some very strange things in the leadership space. More than anything, it gives a sense that the, the leadership development isn't occurring for the 21st century, that our models are outdated. 17% of executives, according to Corn Ferry, are confident their organization has the leadership capability that it needs. And my view is that the main leadership models that are in use today are 20th century models, and they're outdated. And I'll run through two of them. Uh, briefly. And they're outdated because they're not able to compensate for this change. And the first is trait-based leadership. Many of you are probably familiar with uh, Jim Collins' book, Good to Great. Made him a management uh, guru. It was a bestseller. Uh, but it's essentially a trait-based leadership book. And the idea is that if you study high-performing organizations and you just look across their characteristics and you find what they have in common, you can come up with a formula for success, right? And that's why we call it trait-based trait leadership. The problem with trait-based leadership is, is perfectly exemplified by Jim Collins' book. If you bought stock in his 18 companies, because he profiled 18 companies that had this formula of going from good to great, if you had bought stock in those 18 companies, it would have underperformed the index fund. In fact, one of those companies went out of business. And in fact, Jim Collins had to change his model because his model wasn't panning out. And now he writes books going the other direction to explain why he was wrong earlier, right? So trait-based leadership isn't really working. There is no common formula. You can't reduce it down to three or five or 10 magic attributes of successful leadership. The other model that's even more problematic, it's an even older model, is what I call heroic leadership. And this is quite literally what you get if you Google leadership and you look for a picture, right? This is the model of leadership. It's an older model because it, it arose first in the, the 20th century. It was, it was then called the great man theory of leadership. It's the idea that leaders are born, not made. It's the idea that it's kind of genetic. You have this genetic formula for charisma that makes you a good, effective leader. And some people have it and some people don't. 
And it's a model that people really turn to in hard times. It's a model that people turn to in hard times because there's a psychological desire to want to believe somebody's going to get out, of, get us out of this mess. And for those of us in the U.S., you're kind of seeing this now in the presidential race. In tough times, people naturally gravitate towards people that exude strength because they want to believe there's someone that's going to help us. They want to believe there's a human superhero. And so we turn to this model of heroic leadership in tough times. But my view is that it's absolutely a myth and that there's no such thing as heroic leadership. Where I came from, the military, we have a very strong culture of heroic leadership, unfortunately. Um, this is, of course, Washington crossing the Delaware. And a reproduction of this used to hang in the West Wing lobby uh, at the White House, where I worked. And I sat on a couch in a waiting room next to this painting uh, quite often. And so I would hear all the tour guides come through the White House and give uh, the tours uh, a description of this painting. So I learned about it. I, I don't know anything about art, but I know something about this painting. Um, and they would talk about all the inaccuracies with this painting. They would talk about how the Delaware, never, uh, Delaware River never froze this way. They would talk about how the flag was wrong for the period. They'd talk about how it wasn't this little uh, small rowboat, that it was actually a big, long, flat bottom barge. But mostly they talk about the fact that, that Washington wouldn't have been standing up in the boat like this. And when I went back and I looked for an accurate historical depiction of Washington across the Delaware, it was a long, flat bottom barge. And Washington was sort of toward the front of the boat, but he wasn't standing up like this. In fact, he was kind of leaning on a cannon. Why? Because that's what normal people do. They don't do this, <laughs> right? <laughs> and Washington didn't do this. But this is how we perceive heroic leadership. And part of the problem is Hollywood. Hollywood really perpetuates this myth of heroic leadership. One of my old bosses was Stan McChrystal. And in his book, Team of Teams, he talks about this guy, Sean Connery in real life, but Captain Marco Ramius in the movie Hunt for Red October. And in this movie and in the scene, and I won't play it for you, go back and watch it. It's a great, a great Tom Clancy film. We see Captain Ramius as being so good because he's just so smart. His insights are so good, his judgment's so good, and he has the answers when nobody else does. And if you just turn to him, you'll get the problem solved. And that's essentially the way the movie plays out. And it's actually fairly accurate to the submarine culture. It's a culture I know a lot about because I spent a lot of time in these mini subs. In fact, the best job I ever had was driving this thing, the Advanced Sealed Delivery System. It's by far the world's most sophisticated mini sub. And if you've never heard of it, that's fine, because the Navy only built one of them. Uh, it was a very kind of uh, classified program, and then the submarine eventually burned to the ground in a catastrophic battery fire. Um, but it was extraordinary. We could do amazing things. As you see in this picture, one of the things we could do is anchor on the bottom and then lock out of the bottom of the submarine. And people often ask me, like, oh, wow, that's cool. What did that look like? It must have been like Jacques Cousteau or something. I said, no, this is what it looked like. <laughs> the nature of our business meant that we did everything at night and we didn't use any lights. Um, and we always operated in pairs. Uh, and I'll tell you a little bit about a particular operation that I think is instructive. Uh, my swim buddy and I had just locked out in the blackness. Uh, and we always operated in pairs and swim buddies because we had this belief that two is one and one is none, that we were fallible. We were going to make mistakes, and we needed basically two of us to always back one another up. So my swim buddy and I were outside the vehicle, and one of the pieces of equipment we were working with became dislodged. It was very heavy, got snagged on me, and started taking me to the bottom. Well, one of the things we do with the swim pairs is you always connect to your swim pair with a piece of rope, right? You're physically connected. So I started taking him to the bottom with me. But luckily, before he disappeared below, uh, beneath the mini-sub, he had the presence of mind to grab something and stop our descent. And eventually, we collected ourselves and locked back in, weighed anchor, and went back out into the blackness of the ocean. And one of the other amazing things about this mini-sub is we could rendezvous and dock on the back of regular submarines. And this was one of our host submarines, the USS Greenville. Uh, and I spent a lot of time on board this host submarine. And unlike ASDS, you may have actually heard of the Greenville because uh, she's somewhat infamous, because she was involved in a tragic mishap where she collided with and sank the Himi Maru, a Japanese fishing trawler, and she killed uh, nine of her passengers. And I learned a lot about this incident because I talked to the crew of the Greenville, who I got to know, and they were on board when this happened. 
And it's a very complex set of root causes, but one of the main root causes is that the CEO, this gentleman, Captain Scott Waddle, believed in heroic leadership and practiced a model of heroic leadership. And there were people in the control room that day who knew there was probably merchant traffic on the surface and had a suspicion that if they went to the surface and they did this maneuver, there was a risk. And they said nothing. They didn't speak up. Because that's what happens in a culture of heroic leadership. You believe people are invaluable, then you're, then you're in trouble when they actually make mistakes. In our world, we didn't operate that way. We believed that we were all going to screw up all the time, basically. Um, that we were all imperfect and all fallible and always were looking to back each other up. And when I made a mistake and I was headed to the bottom of the ocean, my swim buddy saved us both. But when Captain Scott Waddle needed somebody to speak up and save him from killing nine Japanese, not a word was said. By the way, um, this was uh, one of the most formative learning experiences because of that type of environment I ever had in, in my entire career. And also the coolest vehicles by far I've ever ridden in. Um, very, very neat stuff. This was a close second. Um, uh, six years at the White House, I had the opportunity on a couple of special occasions to travel with the president. And one such trip, we went to Fort Campbell, Kentucky to visit with the team that did the raid on Bin Laden right when they got back. The president went down to give them awards and get a debrief from the team. And while he was doing the awards, I had the opportunity to catch up with some of the team. And one of the things that was really remarkable that they said to me was that they didn't deserve any credit. And this was before books were written, mind you. They didn't deserve any credit, and they kept saying, independently to a man, they kept saying, all the credit goes to the Hilo people or the intelligence people, because what we did doesn't really stand up to what they did. And on the way back, one of the things that the president remarked on that really uh, struck him was what we in leadership consulting call the pronoun test. You listen to an organization's words and language and you get a sense of how they operate. And he was essentially doing a version of that. And on the way home he said, all I heard was we and us. I never heard me or him. I never heard anybody taking credit. It was all about how we, the collective, got the job done, right? It's a very different model of leadership. And it's very common in the special operations community. Most people don't believe me or think, they think I'm joking when they ask, well, what did you do on a combat mission? I usually say my job was to stay out of the way. Right? My job as the leader of a combat special operations unit was mostly to make sure my team had the training and was empowered uh, to do what they needed to do and then stay out of their way and let them do it. And I was there mostly to take care of things and get them help if things went sideways. It's a very different model of leadership than the leader who's there to direct, than the leader who's there to enable. In the egoless model, the leader doesn't think of himself as anything but a team member with a slightly different set of responsibilities. But that's not how we think, right? We still like to think of the individual greatness. And Einstein's my favorite example of this. Um, and this is typically how we remember Einstein, right? The elderly man with the crazy hair. And this is his one of his more famous quotes. Everything that is really great and inspiring is created by the individual who can labor in freedom. But this is probably a more accurate depiction of Einstein. Because at his peak, he was younger. He was a patent clerk. And one of his less known quotes, nothing truly valuable can be achieved except by the unselfish cooperation of many individuals. The dirty little secret about Einstein was that his lone genius was a myth. That he reached great theories. Yes, he had some very important and powerful insights. But he got there because he collaborated with his peers. He wouldn't have developed the theory of general relativity without collaboration with his peers. But that's not how we think of him. We think of him and we celebrate him as being a lone genius and acting on his own. This is probably the best depiction of Einstein because it depicts him as he was, a normal guy. Einstein failed his university entrance exams. He had an illegitimate child he never saw. He became estranged with his wife, divorced her, and married his cousin. Einstein was a patent clerk, not a god. He was a normal person. I had a roommate and close friend uh, named Eric, and Eric was killed in Afghanistan in 2005 when his helicopter crashed. 
That's the incident made famous by a movie and a book called Lone Survivor. He was the commander of that unit. And this is how he's typically depicted. This is the picture of him I see most often when I, when I see pictures of him. The picture I like is this one, him emceeing my wedding, because this is more what he was really like. And I like to remind people that the magic of the Navy SEALs was not that SEALs as individuals were special or gifted or had any sort of abnormal levels of strength or anything. It's simply that they were knitted together into a very kind of unusual team. And that they only got great stuff when you got that collective energy going. But really, at the individual level, they were ordinary people just like us. They're farmers, cooks, fathers, husbands, poets, you name it. Eric loves Shakespeare, by the way. We can expect that our leaders can do heroic things, but we can't expect heroic leadership of our leaders, right? They're not superheroes, and unlike superheroes, they don't come back from the ashes when the helo crashes. And this was a powerful lesson for me, right? At the end of the day, even our leaders are fallible and human. None of us has these superpowers. And finally, to close, to go back to my son, Eric, again. Um, named after my roommate, Eric. And I clearly can't convince him of any of this, right? He's still all about the superheroes. Uh, but they don't exist. They're a myth. We need a new model of leadership for the 21st century, one that's able to address the fact that change is accelerating, uh, change is unpredictable, and we have a really hard time uh, keeping up with change. And the solution can't be a return to trait-based theories of leadership, in my view. And it can't be, although it's tending, trending to be, um, a return to heroic models of leadership. I think the answer has to be turning to empowered teams with common purpose and shared consciousness. And more than anything, it has to be leaders who lead with a very, very strong sense of humility. And they don't believe in their own greatness, not at all, but they believe in the greatness, the collective greatness of their teams. Thanks. It looks like I've got uh, three minutes, and, or you have three minutes and 20 seconds uh, for questions before the reception. It's, a, it's an awkward thing to be standing between an audience and a cocktail reception. But. First of all, thank you very much for your service. and really appreciate that. Um, what are some of the red flags that you see when you go and work with an organization and you kind of, maybe it's not so overt that there's that hero leadership going on, but you can sense it? Right. Um, I mean, probably the most common thing is uh, in a hierarchical model of corporate America leadership, which is what most, almost all companies have, by the time you get to a position of responsibility, you've been conditioned to expect that you're going to have a lot of responsibility. Right? One of my favorite things to tell CEOs is Congratul congratulations on making CEO. You're now unqualified for your job. Because you got here by virtue of a skill set that you no longer need. You need a new skill set. But most of them keep doing what they've been doing, which is telling people what to do, managing process, and so forth. And once you get to a certain level of leadership, it's no longer about any of that, right? It's about emotional intelligence. It's about empathy. It's about empowering teams. Uh, it's not, it's no longer, it can no longer be about telling people what to do. It has to be about the empowerment, the vision, and so forth. And making that gear switch at the, at the topmost level is probably the most common thing. Other than that, the, the, by, by far and away, um, we're all psychologically geared to look out for our own security and safety, right? Maslow's hierarchy of needs is a pretty hard thing to get away from. We're all wired to think in terms of our own safety and security. And people think about that in the job environment. So people tend to put kind of self-preservation and security ahead of the collective goal, and that's a very difficult thing to change. And one of the ways that manifests most frequently is in firewalls and stovepipes and impeded information flow because information and knowledge is power and if you hold it then you have the power and if you give it you lose your power but if you give it the team and the organization is enabled and works better right so breaking down those barriers and changing the mindset uh, but that's a great question and, and thanks for your appreciation all right one minute left anyone else Okay, well, oh, yeah. yeah. It was just a very powerful finishing statement you made there. Could you just repeat that? <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> We're gonna have to play the replay. You guys have instant replay? Um, Yeah, I'll get it for you. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I'll, we'll pull it back up. Well, thank you very much, and uh, enjoy tomorrow. Nice being with you.